and we are live-ish, as this is a recording, not a live show, um, for a number of different reasons. We're going to do it in one take, though. Oh, absolutely going to do it in one take. So, uh, it is the third day... The third day of Christmas. This weekend, this, this weekend, yes. I spent all weekend decking my house out. If anybody wants to find me in Leeds, just look out for a light beacon coming from Horsforth, yeah, so, and you'll see me. So, for those of you who don't know, Michael is... Mr. Christmas. Um, the spirit of Christmas lives in Michael Price. Uh, That's why I'm wearing my suit. And he is wearing his Christmassy suit. He will get more and more and more obsessively festive as the next few weeks progress. And this is only the beginning. Maybe we'll do a good book review on somebody. <laughs> Let's Maybe bring... we'll see. It, 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 but it, for, for, to, Let's just bring a little that, bit of that drudgery back. Uh, good, uh, well, that Drucker guy. Uh, Peter Drucker. I don't think we're ever going to bring him back. I don't. <laughs> I think that's going to be a miracle too far for us. Okay, so we are on the last, the final furlong, as they say in horse racing, of uh, Sales Leadership by Keith Rosen. I've got to say, I think we've rushed it a little bit, this book. I think we could have, we could have spent longer on it, you know. Yeah, well, I think we've been quite focused on making, trying to get into a routine of... A book every four weeks yeah yeah whereas actually that suits the format of our show but i think you could have done particularly in the earlier chapters a chapter um agreed a i felt we particularly the first three chapters where actually if you look at this book the real meat is in the for me it's waning a bit now for me yeah me too but i felt the real meat was in the first few chapters yeah, with, exactly. the, with the leads process which is brilliant by the, the way coaching process which is, has been great I felt like some of these later chapters, for the first time, there's, it, it, I think later on in one of the chapters that I've read, I felt for the first time in this book, unlike I have with every book where it's been rammed down my throat, I thought, ah, you're holding a bit back on me now, Keith, so that you can sell me some training. But only, but only once, which has been very pleasant in comparison to a lot of the other I, books. I can tell read. a lot by how much I've liked the book, by how many notes I take. And, and I always have a little notes. bit of a refresh before we get yeah, together and do this. Yeah, we both sit here, don't And we? I think, I've not written many notes in this chapter. Really? Yeah. So Which one in, in chapter 10? Chapter 10, Mindful Coaching, the so, inner game of coaching champions. So, yeah, so the, I think where we're getting here is now the what, what Keith refers to as the inner game of coaching champions. Mm. Um, and I guess it's about coaching oneself to be a good coach. Yeah, this is about what makes the coach good. Yeah, and it's, a, it's an interesting one. You know, I use my sports analogies... Um, they did a big shake-up at Leeds Rhinos this year, and one of the positions they actually put into place mm. was almost what they've referred to as a director of performance whose job it is to coach the coaching staff. Right. And his job is to make sure that the coaching staff are developing mm. and not stultifying. I think that there was a lot of remorse at the fact that a previous incumbent had done a very good job but burned out in the end and had stopped doing anything new or fresh, and it cost him his job in the end. So I, I do think that there is an extremely important case for who is coaching the coaches and is the coach coaching himself so I do think that the chapter itself was valid I haven't got that much out of it there's some for me there's a lot of it was very early on where we're talking about how to identify and eradicate costly assumptions and about assumptions in communication and the first thing that I wanted to pick up on was Keith talks about mindful coaching and I think that if we, we, we meet Keith, I've got five quid that says next week, if I say to Keith, are you a man that meditates, Keith? I've got five quid that says yes. Because I think what he's very into is being mindful of and aware of one's own communication, which is very much a byproduct of one's own mindfulness. But he hasn't quite rammed mindfulness down everybody's throat. Well, I don't know. I think mindfulness, mindfulness is just a very fashionable... It's a fashionable, very sweeping term, well, It's yes. a very fashionable thing to be into so, now, isn't it? He says here, assumptions can run so deep in our daily thinking we don't recognise them because all we see, if not challenge, are assumptions disguised as facts that we believe to be true. Um, yeah, that's great. And I get that. For me, I wrote here that assumptions are the only way that we make sense of the universe. If we didn't assume things, we'd all be in a nut house. Yeah, you're right, 100%. Um, and we need to make assumptions... So I, I, and so assumptions I, are based on experience. Yeah, and and, and I think it, I just didn't quite like the way it was worded to an extent. It didn't quite gel for me. He talks about assumptions being such a widespread problem. And I wrote, I don't necessarily believe that the assumptions that we make in our communication are a problem. They're just more of a thing. 
Yeah, I mean, he, he, he wrote down all these different 33 different um, assumptive driven words to challenge. And I thought that was very useful, actually. Yeah, no, since I know them. Well, yeah, I'm making an assumption based on the fact I know them. Yeah, okay. Um, based and, on what happened before. And, and well, what, Yeah, it's not a bad steer to take. I actually wrote here, he's put tip from the coach, get your head out of your assumptions, which is useful. And, and do you know what? If I was never been trained in anything around linguistics or language, then, yeah, I would probably be more excited reading these than I was. For me, I think that he's into a topic here in the book that's another book. Oh, definitely. Another yeah. book by another much more qualified author, mm. um, particularly around NLP. So what he's really talking about here are the delusions, distortions and generalizations that we have. And actually, if that's an area of interest to somebody that's listening, I would swat up more on the meta model of communication under the auspices of NLP, where you'll really start to use people's language at a much more precise level. And I think it's a, that's a, a little appetite wetter, but whew, that's just such a much bigger topic than how it's been covered here. And then he talks about shift your questions to focus on what's right. And I do like this about uh, reinforcing positive behaviours about a sale that's been done. But what I didn't like was... Yeah, that was just a win, win analysis, I thought. Well, what, what I put was, I like it, but for me, that's the basis of a sales meeting presentation, not something you would do with a salesperson straight after the deal. Well, I don't know. I thought that was quite well-timed where he put it there, actually, I must say. What, well, you would do that. So, what you, what, so would you just sit down with a person and say, listen, great deal, well done. And then you would almost go into a coaching call about getting them to reinforce the positive behaviours that they I done. wouldn't have done that to reinforce the positive behaviours. What I would have done is figured out why we won it and how we can then replicate that into something else. Yeah, that's because you're doing that from your standpoint, aren't you? Well, what other standpoint should I do it from? Well, what Keith's saying is you would do it from the standpoint of... Oh, I'll disagree with them. ...reinforcing the positive behaviour with... Well, I disagree. Well, yeah, he's, he's, he's probably right. Then that's not how I read it. Maybe I misread it. That's not how I read it. Well, he's, he's saying build a world-class sales team, reinforce the behaviours you want them to engage in. Turn your binoculars around and start magnifying and focusing on what they're doing right often, more often than what they're doing wrong. Yeah, but I didn't think that was so that you were anchoring to them, that, that to them. I thought that was so that you could figure out how you could replicate that again in another sale or another model. No, he's going to try to reinforce the behaviour. Fair enough. Okay. And then phraseology, one word away from a coaching breakthrough. Um, so it, where he's getting into now is getting people to be much more mindfully aware of the language that's taking place in the coaching conversation, isn't he? Yes. Um, and what we're into again, as I've said just before, is I think this is a much bigger topic. What amazes me is how few people study this at a, at a subject level. For me, it's the fundamental essence of salesmanship. See, I just don't think it is. I don't think it is at all. And I'll tell you what I what, base that on. Understanding understanding what people say, understanding how people act, understanding what it makes can't people be. tick. It can't be, because I've, I've met and placed so many people that don't fall into that category. No, but we've talked about this before, and that's because we work in an anomalous industry where actually, whilst the earnings are high, actually often the quality of salesmanship is lesser. Yes, and we are producing this book and this content for our market. Yeah. So actually, if you're a bread salesperson in the FMCG market, they shouldn't be listening to this. It's not relevant. We're discussing this book in the context of our market. Yeah, we are. And actually, if you look at who recommends this book, Oracle, yeah. Salesforce, whatever else. So I'm saying in the IT sales people that I've met in 18 years of doing this job, it's going slightly off tangent here, I don't think that many people really think about the uh, language, the language and the way it's used. I think hardly any do. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I just don't think they do. But I, but and I don't think that makes it important it right, as a coaching. I, I don't th in, in the 20 years I've been doing it, I, I don't meet many that have anywhere nearly a sufficient focus on their own personal development. Yes, I would agree with that as well. It's slightly unfair because some of the very best do. Usually. I think what happens a lot of the time is... It's usually a dividing factor. Yes, yeah, so I think what happens a lot of the time is training is provided at a corporate level. Yeah. And some people pick on it and some don't. And then yeah. and then there's another segment who just go out and do it off their own back. They're normally but, the ones... But they're, but and they're, they're, normally they're the very few and far between. Top, 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 top. And, that, and that's my point about sort of Keith's 
model about phraseology and all the rest of it. I just glanced through it thinking, well, no one's going to do this, Keith. No, I don't think so either. I think it's, it's great, great. But just it's no one's going to do it. It's great content and it's correct content. It's 100% and right. And it's entirely valid content. And it's content that if you were interested in self-development and if you really are motivated, it's a rabbit hole. If you paid me by the hour, I would say that's a rabbit hole every top class sales guy should go down at some point. But they still have the time. No, because it's a big rabbit hole. Yeah, they don't have the time to do that. It's a big rabbit hole. And it's an expensive rabbit hole to go down from a training perspective. And actually, you know, you've got to have a coach and a salesperson, both of whom have got a good enough grasp of the language. Yeah, and maybe it comes down to the way that we're training and developing salespeople in general. I mean, that's a big bugbear for me. Actually, maybe I'd like to see universities providing degrees in professional salesmanship. And maybe actually where we should be as a, as a community... Mm. is maybe we should be putting some of the universities under more pressure rather than doing these rubbish generic business, business studies business studies degrees sounds like that my degree nigh, on, nigh on useless i'd like to see more university degrees come out that are branded degree in professional sales excellence yeah i agree but we can't go on about that uh, about the book so um and he, he's just getting into use of language for example he gives a point here did you define sven did you ask sven how he defines the word strategy actually i didn't you shared with me that when you asked Sven to become more strategic, he said he didn't want to micromanage his team. I mean, that's a very good point. As what, well, did as he well. mean, what did he mean he told you he didn't want to micromanage his team? And he's right. It's about picking up on the language. and. Well, going he said, through. how do you define strategy as yeah. well? Good yeah. question. How Great question. How do you define strategy? What is strategy? And just for the benefit of the listeners, he's talking through a... Case study. A case study as to when you've got two people talking about the same thing but using different words for the same thing. Correct. Basically. And he's saying you need to have a level playing field of understanding of knowledge. Yeah. So, um, and then he's got these springboard questions. When you say stressed and overwhelmed, how do you mean? Can you go into more depth regarding what you mean when you say difficult workload? Or when you heard the customer is pushing back, can you say more about that? I th so I think this is part of the book you've really got to read to get. You and I can talk about it. What, 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 and I wrote here, it's really useful. You know, what we're into here is some basic reflective listening and meta model use of language. It's great. Um, and then he talks a little bit more about coaching the written message. And uh, I didn't really like that. Well, I thought the next thing was interesting because he... Um... What about what about if a client did an email role play in an interview process? So what Well, that's what he's put here, isn't he? He's yeah. put, schedule a meeting with a candidate, phone her in person, and forward these three emails to them. Each candidate will then be asked to craft a response to each email. Yeah. I put on here, it's okay because the, the candidate will just cheat. And then he's put on the next page. Can they cheat? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me laugh. So, so, but what do I think of that? I think the number one best way to interview a candidate is to role play with them full stop. Yeah. 100%. I'm with you, Pricey. 100%. I, I just no use to me and you. Oh, well, it's used to you and I. Yeah, because we pick the candidates that, that yeah, we'll pick is. the candidates that we know will get through the role plays. Well, no, I pick the candidates that are right for the client. Yeah. But, you know, I mean... I think it's the number one right thing to do. I think sometimes actually clients are a bit nervous of it because the candidates feel it's demeaning. No, the client's nervous of it because the clients don't have a sufficiently detailed understanding of the competencies that they're looking for in the role play. So they just feel the role play is superfluous. You reckon? Yeah, definitely. It's because the clients don't really understand the necessary skills that they're looking you for. Know, I said to a client the other day, he, he, we were talking about it. I said, you're just terrible at recruiting. Yeah, he no, said, what do you mean? So you're, you're really bad at it. <laughs> But would I introduce that? Yeah, 100%. How do you think the candidates would go with it? How do you think in our market the candidates would go with it? Depends on the, so depends on the market. The, I think in the... In this the, fellow this morning that we've had, uh, we had a fellow turn a job down this morning, we knew he was going to do it. You know, neither of us have exactly... I right. think he'd have been all right with it. He's a good guy. So if you'd said to him, listen, the client wants you to go through an email role play to see how you communicate in writing. I think he'd have, I, I, I think he'd have been all right. I'd tell you the ones that wouldn't do it are the more arrogant markets. So like it a lot, not the, a lot of the security guys are arrogant and overpaid. There is no way they would get involved in arrogant, any form of role play. Arrogant, overpaid, and have far too many potential suitors. And not enough skills. So I think they're just going to walk away from that. Yeah. Okay. Whereas I think in a market that's got more equilibrium to it, like the BRP market's a good example, I think there's a greater likelihood they would. I think in some of the other markets where they're not very skilled as salespeople, they wouldn't want to do it. I think the whole... Getting somebody involved in a role play, be it an email or a telephone call or whatever, it's the candidates that are frightened that don't want to do it. Or don't need to do it, and they don't do it. Yeah. Do you yeah, not I agree? Mean, I, I you do. don't look well, like you do. Mike, the, eight o'clock this morning, 
I was writing a chapter in my book and part of the chapter of the book I was writing about this morning was talking about should clients role play at second interview and it was a categorical yes. It's 100% yes. A categorical yes. No, I don't yes think the clients should, know how to role with, play. No. And that for me though is normally, when we're getting on tangent here, it's normally due to the fact that they don't understand the necessary skills they're looking for and haven't very precisely agreed what the criteria are when they do the role play. So they just sit there doing the role play and then they're all sat there going, hey, sell me this pen. <laughs> oh, yeah. So let's talk about um, time management. Again, I mean, Keith here, he's got a bit, bit of a section on time management. I know uh, what you're uh, going to say here. Go on. You're going to totally, fundamentally disagree with coaching time management. Uh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> Me too. I, I, and I think if you're going to cover time management, time management is a section in its own. One, it's a, it's by, a whole... By, by Stephen Covey. Seven oh, Habits. Keith's written a book on time management. Well, it's not going to be as good as coffees. Uh, or getting things done. I hate getting things done. Well, you know I like GTD. I hate it. My, my, put, uh, I've, I've, my notes were totally disagree at a 100% level. If people are disorganised, then they are wrong. It's, Especially yeah, at a senior level. They should want it and seek the learning. If they don't, they are wrong. If you're coaching a senior guy about his time management... He you, should not be in that job. You what are the you, wrong person. What are you paying that amount of money for? Completely agree. And if that senior guy hasn't acquired some time management skill and isn't organised and on it and doesn't know how to block time and manage his time, by the time he's in a senior job, he is a wrong un. Yes, I completely agree. I think uh, you're I, I get, right. So, I, I get, for me, coaching... the, I, I just... You and I have coached people on the topic of time management. There's no point. But what we have both discovered is that is a journey that you undertake yourself when you feel sufficient pain. Correct. And if you don't feel, until you feel the I've pain. I've bought people diaries and all we've sorts. We've done it. We've, nobody, nobody out there has tried harder than me and you to coach people on that subject. Absolutely. And we both know from painful experience, you do not lead that horse to water and hope it drinks. What we both know is... Actually, the only horses that drink that water are the ones that wake up one morning and go, "What? How?" the ones that come to you and say, I'm struggling, what do I do? Or copy how, or whatever. Or they just go, can I copy what you do? How do you manage your time? But, but nine out of ten times, if you try and coach that, you try and bring it up, if somebody is disorganised and you try and help them do it, they will not do it. They have got to go on their own. Every business person goes on that journey. I agree. Anyway, let's move on through this chapter a little bit because we spent a long time talking about a chapter that I didn't take any notes on. <laughs> um, and, and then at page 180, I put um, da -da 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 -da, support, time management and productivity. I actually got plugged for another book. Fair enough, Keith, it's about time. I, I, I didn't have a problem with that, that he's actually plugging his old book. I thought you, you've not, you know, you've been very, very and what good. What do you think about this last one then? Can you coach fear and confidence? What page am I on? 184. Go on, just give me the give me an example. I just of thought the... it was interesting. He, he, he's put notice that the topics discussed in this chapter are not as easily identified as coaching moments, which are typically identified as either problems to fix or skills that need to be worked on. Managers have no idea how to approach these conversations or development opportunities. And then he goes on and, and, and talks a little bit about two of the coaching topics worth putting in your line of vision are confidence and fear. Every manager I've met has a hard time approaching these topics. And I just thought it was, a, a, you know, a, we employed a guy who worked here for quite a while and then went off the boil a little bit and left, really. And I always thought he was a confidence player. Yes. And I thought, can you coach confidence? No, you couldn't. I think a lot of that, well, he's, he's written a point here about a, a lot of it falls more under our EQ. I think a lot of that is personal awareness and observation and getting to know the individuals that are in your gang and that are in your team and knowing... Oh, so do you think Keith would have said if you understood them properly, uh, you yeah, I think coach so. them? I think if you, if, you're, if you give a shit about your team mm. and you listen and you observe, you soon work out that one's a confidence player, needs praise. That one doesn't care. It's about actually knowing what makes people tick, doesn't it? Yep. So that particular individual we were talking about, he was a real confidence player, wasn't he? When he was up, he was really, really, really... He was unstoppable. Yeah, just outrageously talented when up, but easily it deflated 
you could knock him over with a feather often. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and half the battle as a leader of that individual in, concerned was working the confidence and just generally almost spinning the plate of confidence to stop it falling over, wasn't it? Absolutely. So what's the next chapter then? Uh, know your players transforming talent through observation and feedback. He gets onto one of my favourite subjects here. Okay. I put at the top of this chapter I wrote, this book doesn't talk a lot about leading the group. It was just an observation I made. I, I sat, there, um, this, sat there reading it and I thought, it doesn't really talk about leading the group, leading the, the team. It talks about leading individuals or coaching individuals. But I don't feel like it really talks about leadership in the bigger context. Peter Drucker would talk about leadership in a different way, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's not in the book. It didn't come into my head. I didn't didn't make any reference to it. And then, and then what we're getting into here, chapter 11, is know your players transforming talent through observation and feedback. Um, and there's a question that he tends to ask managers. How do you determine the root cause as to why someone is a top performer and why someone is underperforming? And then, the, the, and then what we get into here is a deeper dive into that topic, really, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. So he, he talks about three ways, evaluation and inspection, conversation and observation. Yes, absolutely. He mentions a little bit earlier on, he says, however, in covering the why, the real root cause of the issue, or the who, the often very elusive, limiting thinking, assumptions, values or outlook that drives people's actions and behaviour, it goes on and on. He basically says, figure out what their why is. Yeah. That's one of my favourite topics, that actually. If I had one piece of advice to give the people that we hire for, I'd say you've got to find out what their why is and why it is. What, in, as an interview strategy? As an interview as strategy. Or as a leadership just strategy? Just all over. I think it's really important that. Okay. So on the subject then of uncovering the gap, as he calls it. Mm. Observation, evaluation, inspection and conversation to work out. I what, think what, through what, observation is the key one there, isn't it? I put here... He talks about and just to be clear ways. to people who are listening, what he's talking about here is he said you can't just look at somebody's numbers to figure out whether they're any good. No, what he's it, saying is he's saying have a proper look get, at them, get in the car and go to a meeting with them, sit by their desk with them, listen to some and, calls and look them, at their numbers and look at the numbers. And that's and, what these and three sections are. And you'll are. get a much wider picture. Thank you for putting the context on that. I wrote at the level we play, I don't think any desk side coaching and very little in car coaching or post-meeting coaching takes place I think I in, our, any of it. in our universe. I think what most people are doing is, 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 is as Keith has talked about it, rightly, is managing the spreadsheet and not, not the... Yeah, not this the is a wider person. conversation, isn't it? Because actually, for our market, senior IT sales, if I'm paying somebody 100k, I just want an outcome. Yeah, if I'm paying 100k, should I really have to get in the car with you, come to a meeting? And, and look at your diary. Or, or should I, A... Oh, show me your diary. Let's have a look if you've blocked some time out to work on that tender. And B, exactly. And B, should I really have to come to a meeting with you and then sit down in the car and go, so tell me about how that went. What do you reckon? Uh, and do a coaching session. But in general, should you do that? Let, let's let's say you had a team of F FMCG guys. Should you be through observation? If I, running, if I was running a team of 40, 45, 50k sales guys, I'd be out on the road with them all the time. I'd be out on the road with younger ones than that. More junior ones than that as yeah, well. Yeah, all the time. Sat in the car with them, talking to them. All right, tell me about that. Tell me about that. Just get getting to know them. So he's right in that, I think. He is, but I, I just from. And I, I think, think observation is the key to that. How do they? How do the salespeople interact with their prospects? I, I just think in our universe, I don't think a lot of that is going to go on. Oh, definitely not. All goes on. The, for me, the best coaching tool is the call recording. Yes, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because the people that don't want you to record the calls. Are normally the ones not doing a good job but what i have also found over my own career is if you can get some really good call recordings you can sit a salesperson down with the call recording you can press play and say you stop the tape when you want and they will know anybody that's not completely stupid will go what you find is you run the tape so i've done loads of these they run the tape and they go oh 
Oh, well, listen, Johnny, when I used to play a lot of golf, I used to video, I used to video my golf you swing. You video your swing. I don't need a pro to tell me what to do. You don't need the pro. You get, oh, what am I doing that for? Exactly. So half, if you're half decent and half motivated and you put the tape on, they'll go, oh, I can't believe I've done that. And you go, you can't believe you've done that. And they go, oh, well, I just can't believe I asked the double question there. I asked mm -hmm. them two questions mm -hmm. at once. Ah, okay. Tell me about that. And the coaching sessions are incredible. So you're easy. talking about observation. Anyway. Yeah. So they're, I think those coaching sessions are So then Keith goes to on do. to say, coach the person, not the spreadsheet. Uh, and it says, data doesn't assess skill set, acumen, core competencies, best practice, knowledge, communication, attitude, consistent execution of your sales process, so on and so forth. And he says that what you should be doing is getting a closer look of actually what they're doing rather than the data that surrounds them. And he's absolutely 100% right about that, I think. What's that? about properly as assessing people. Yeah. He's saying the data doesn't assess people, your observation of them does. Correct. And he goes into this, he's saying, coach the person, not the spreadsheet. So he's saying by doing that, you can find out where the person's failing and coach Correct. those individual parts. Okay. Whereas SAP and Oracle just shout at people. Do they? According to the candidates, yes. I don't think there's so much shout, they just get put under pressure to bring the number in, don't they? Well, that's what I'm being... Um, uh, purposefully sort of objectionable about it okay because it seems to work for sap and oracle just looking at the data doesn't it maybe that's because their brand is big is it of course it is because there's a whole other load of factors that aren't taken into account as to whether you are or aren't successful right we'll come on some we'll come on to this again in a minute all right so observation reluctance do you know I, my issue is is a should i be observing a 100k guy or an 80k or a 70k or a 60k basic salary salesman point one b I think it's about the economics of the situation. Mm. And what I mean by that is, I don't think people want to be observed and coached. Why? Um, they don't want to be observed or undermined. And more than anything, I think that there is such mobility of labour. There is at the moment. In the current job market. And some of the people that we work with can potentially be so precious that if, apropos nothing, a leader did say, do you know what? I am into this coaching malarkey and it is actually how I'm going to roll and I am going to start going out on the road mm. with some of these guys. I think the mobility of labour is such that it makes people precious to be observed. I agree. It's the economics of the scenario. Mm -mm. If we were in the depths of the recession, people would be saying, come out on the road with me, boss. Yes, I agree. I, it's going to bring me to the, my summary of the whole book in a minute, this. Much okay. more early than I want to. Um... I do like the word enrol. Keith's got me bought in on the word enrol. If I take, and I'm just saying that from this next title, if I take enrol people in observation, just enrol people in everything. It's about getting the salespeople, people that work for you, to agree with what's happening. If I take one thing from the book, well, that's what I'm going to take from it, actually. What, to be less dictatorial? Yes. I'm not dictatorial, I just don't care if people don't follow me. It just doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> I just think, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. I taught my daughter to ride a bike this weekend. If she didn't want to listen to me, she'd just fallen off, wouldn't she? But I like his idea of enrolling people. Okay. Okay. Anyway. Um, and then the, he, there's some other good stuff here. Effective pe feedback starts with self-assessment. Uh, and he's talking about the ability for the manager to tailor feedback specific to each employee is a distinction of the best coaches. Explains why coaching is often Well, well, well he then talks about the five questions that get yeah. asked. I think that happens all the time. What's that? Those five questions. How do you feel the call meeting went? What did you observe? How do you feel? How did it feel when delivering your presentation? That's the standard question a sales manager asks, isn't it? No, I, I, I don't think it is. Oh, I do. I think what happens most of the time is they go, they they get in the car and they start off with, "So, how did that go?" The sales guy says, "It went all right," and the guy goes, "Yeah," and he says. And then at that point, the sales manager gets into, well, you should have done this and you should have done that and you could have done this and you could have done that, which is what Keith is saying. And actually, more often than not, most sales managers tell the, tell the poor sales guy, if you'd done this and done that and done this and done that, you'd have been all right. And then the sales guy sat there, utterly, frankly, crestfallen in his car, mm. thinking, thanks for that. I feel shot to pieces now, even though actually the sales manager did it with really positive intent. The poor guy's taken down two or three confidence notches mm. when actually he's not run too bad a meeting. The guy himself wasn't that happy with the meeting anyway, whereas actually that framework and those questions are really beautifully worded. 
How do you feel the core meeting went? What did you observe? How did it feel when delivering your presentation? What did you sense from your prospects, clients what you were delivering to? What did you do well? Where do you feel you got stuck? What could you have done differently? What, if anything, do you need to improve or change to achieve better results next time? And then I think the bit that I, I, um, th think is key there is obviously to get to an accountability point after that session. And it's dead easy to go on the road with somebody. Mm. All right, tell me about this, tell me about that. Run a really good script like that. How would you rate yourself regarding achieving the objectives of the meeting? And then actually have somebody say, well, actually, maybe get to a point in the coaching conversation where you don't then get into accountability. And I did think this chapter could have just leaned a little bit more on going back to it's great observing, but you've got to get some take takeaways from your observation and you've got to make those accountable. Otherwise, there's no point in doing the. Doing I, the I didn't really understand his model, actually. No? I just didn't get my head around it, actually. How oh, it okay. sort of worked. I read it three or four times. You know, on this page 194. I think it felt a bit like a diagram for diagram's sake, actually. I didn't get that into it. Did you not? I just couldn't understand it, really. But it was a good diagram, I'm sure. Well, it Keith. took up a better page I didn't have to read. <laughs> um, what, what, yeah, and then a, a good tip from the coach. When sharing your observations, don't share more than one or two, depending on how major a change they are. Save the rest for another joint sales call or suggest bringing these topics into your next coaching session when you've got time. I thought that was a really, really pertinent point. I've done it myself where I've sat there with somebody with like 11 things and the poor individuals walked out just thinking, I can't, I, I've done it, I know I've done it, where I've done what I thought was a coaching session where people have walked out less confident than before they walked in. Well, yeah, it's interesting. There was once this thing about I've Nick, about Nick so Faldo. Old. And he had some swing uh, guru who told him that he had to remember 34 different things in his swing. <laughs> it was in, it yeah. was in, it was, and you, that's the same, isn't it? Of course it is. It's like, it's like rugby coaches, they, they, they never give the team, never give any individual player more than one or two instructions for a game. Because they're rugby players. Right. But they're human beings, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. Uh, under pressure, you can only remember so much, can't you? Absolutely. So where yeah, are you at now? So he's, he's talking about other things you can observe, which I think is really useful that are indicators of performance, skill, where the, where, where the salesperson's at. So he's talking about things like CRM usage. Do you know what's interesting? I, I put CRM usage. Do, do you know what I've always noticed what? about people that, are do, that, that have done, are on the verge of doing a bad job for us? The notes that they take are poor. I think you can tell That's a lot interesting. Do you by, yeah, I do, yeah. I think you can tell a lot by somebody's state of mind in terms of what they are willing to leave in the CRM system. It's a it's a marker in my own mind myself of the discipline, yeah, of yeah. making good notes. Yes, because it takes time. Yes, it takes it, well, it's, it's a combination I... of things, isn't it? One, it's I'm under that much stress and pressure, and I'm that freaked out. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do a shit job and rush through th it. That my brain isn't engage isn't functioning properly. Yeah, yeah. Two, I'm disengaged, so I'm not functioning properly because I'm disengaged. I'm under that much pressure. Yeah. Um. It, 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 well. There's the old phrase, I don't know if Pete Ingram's listening, I remember once him turning up at an office that I ran and he literally ran his finger along a windowsill and he found dust on his finger, a big thick layer of it. Right. And he looked at me and he went, well, now I know why you're not billing anything over here. It's the same, isn't it? It's about having pride in that which we uh, do. But, and 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 and, I, and then he got in his car and went home. Literally, it was only there half an hour. But his point was, as I later learned, if your office isn't uh, isn't spick and span, what else isn't right? Exactly. If, what else isn't right? Is he, are you making notes properly? Are you? So it's it's usually I think what you've got here are these observation points. They're indicators of other stuff, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've not yeah. got that right, what else have you not got right? If you've not been to the gym this morning, what else have you not done? If, you, if he's not had breakfast this morning, what else hasn't he done? Which is a very negative way of looking at it. Yeah, but, but they're I, only warning signs for Keith to then dig but, into. But as a leader and as a coach, they're, they're indicators. Kevin Sinfield talked about it when, he, when they couldn't work out why leads were doing badly. He found, a, he did three video sessions, three days running. And on the third day, there was still a protein shaker cup from the first day. And he gave a press conference and the press conference said, what do you think's wrong, Kevin? And he told the story about how he found the protein shaker and he said, that's what's wrong. Right, let's employ Kevin. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we need to get going through this a little bit, really. Next um, one. 
I just wrote all, all sorts of things here, really. Um, I'm on page 199 about coaching and development. Um, and I think he put some example scripts in here that I think are great. Really good. Yeah, actually. really good, actually. I'd use those scripts, you know, I think they're a lovely script. I'm not going to read it out, but, yeah, you know, basically, Keith scripts it well. And if you read that four or five times, you took that into your next meeting, I think you'd have some good ideas in your head. Chapter 12, then. I started writing a summary on my chapters. I put, not a bad chapter. I think if you read the book properly, you'll know pretty much all of this stuff already. This is a long chapter talking about 15 different points that kill the coaching process. Okay. He has covered every single one of them already. They're really good, though. That's They're a, a good summary, but I mean, come on, man. You know, they've, they've all been covered. <laughs> okay. Toxic tactic number one. Nine painfully stupid, disempowering words to exactly. stop using. Already Can't, covered it. won't, wouldn't, shouldn't. If I couldn't, couldn't. be bothered, I'd have referenced the, the other pages. I like that. But I'm a, you know I'm a big fan I of know, but using that, I, I don't dislike it. But I think at some point, in, in any book, be it this or any other, if they've said it, they've said it. I don't think he has said it earlier. Oh, he said it a thousand times. What? Right, let's find the chapter. You can keep reading through it if you want. Toxic tactic... Here's, here's one for you. Toxic tactic number two. Are you coaching people or closing them? He's already said that. Yeah. So, uh, here's... He's right, obviously. Here you go. And the problem, problem-focused problem questions. I actually heard... Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but I actually observed a sales call in bet between a sales leader and a salesperson last week. I was present when it happened and it was on speakerphone. And in this call, there was a conversation about a deal taking place. The deals near near the, as, as one person once rather pleasantly euphemistically put, near the vinegar strokes. Um, and it, it's close to coming in, but there's been some slippage in the deal and a little bit of feature creep in the solution. And the sales leader concerned all he cared about was holding a witch hunt as to why there had been feature creep and why it hadn't been qualified. Mm. And I, I sat there, you know, particularly in the context of the fact we're reading this at the moment, and I wanted to grab the phone and say, mate, you're bringing no value to this conversation, son. You're doing my nutting now. But I couldn't because I, I wasn't meant to be in the room whilst this call was taking place mm. with this particular sales guy. Um, but he's right. Why didn't you close the deal? Why aren't you going to make your number this quarter? Why can't you improve your relationship with partner X, customer Y, peer Z, direct report X? Why didn't you qualify it better? They're just, that they're valueless questions. And the only thing that they do is bring people down. God knows I know it. I've done it. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're right. Obviously Keith's right. Yeah. But that's this chapter. I've just read it and thought, yeah, right. Fair enough, you're right. Yeah, okay. And then he's put toxic tactic number three, coaching in your own image. What about patience, Pricey? Before, before, on toxic tactics, he talks a little bit about, the, about people losing patience. Well, you can see why they lose patience. Well you, well, you know I'm a man that has struggled over the years with that. So what's your, but, but, you see, we're coming, we're coming to my summary of the book in a minute. Which is? Keep your shit together and ask some questions. No, I, you know, I, I think Keith lives, Keith, Keith lives in this just ideal world. I don't I, think I, this is real world. I'll tell you now, Keith, a a, he hasn't been a salesman, I don't think. Well, we've got Keith coming on the show next week. And it's a brilliant book, so I don't want to knock it. And I can't wait. Oh, one me too. One of the things I'd like to explore with our guest is I sense that a lot of his clients... Oh, you've, are you've very take, corporate. They're all massive. I was in PepsiCo. I was with PepsiCo in Denmark. Oracle, Microsoft. Correct. It, it was the Oracle in Ireland, wasn't it, in one of his examples? Yeah. Yes. And he was with Microsoft in South Africa. Yes. So, good for Keith. He's got a good business. And do you know what? He's the coach's coach. And do you know what? His book's pretty brilliant. I've learned a lot. And do you know what? I've taken a lot away from this book. And do you know what? I'm using some of the stuff. And that, in and of itself, I think is a true accolade for me to give a book. But, but right we've, now... We've been through a few in the show... This is easily the I've, best. ...where I've walked away, and if you said to me what was in that book a week later, I'd say, I guess you can't remember. But your point is about patience. So let's put it another way. I'm a £10 million IT company. Correct. It's December. Owner, is owner the end of, manager. December is the, is the end of the financial year. You're the year. owner manager. 
oh, I know, let's just have a nice <laughs> cup of tea and talk about your deal. No, I want my deal fucking closed. <laughs> and that's the real world, I think. It is, it is, isn't it? And that takes us on to toxic tactic number three, coaching in your own, own image. Well, what's wrong with that? I know, I know. I've yeah, got did, somebody who didn't who's... seem to hurt Pareto when they sold out for many millions. Well, it doesn't seem to hurt anybody, does it? I know, I've got this really, really good person who's really good at doing it. Copy him. Yeah, well, often you and I go to companies, don't we, where actually what you tend to find is the people are culturally so alike. Well, they hire in their own image. They hire in their own image. All the time, 100%. And therefore clearly coach in their own image. Must do. Um, and you end up, there is... You and go to certain a lot of big egos. You go to certain companies and they have a type. Of course they do. There is a type. And that's what they pay us for. And they pay us to work out what that type is. They don't know they've paid us for that. They don't even know that they have the type. They don't even know they've paid us to find that. No. And, and the client doesn't often know that there is a type that goes to work there. It's just that's what everybody's like and... Surely everybody's like this. Mm. But actually what they don't realise is they're not. It's because that you or I or a, another talented recruiter goes and rumbles it. And then they coach around that type. Mm. So I think there's a little bit more about that whole coaching in your own image. And also I think it's sometimes unfair to be a bit as, to be as disparaging about it. Because actually often companies you and I know that have been very successful where people have created an army of mini-me's. Look at QAS in the late 90s. Thank you very much. Look at CA, look at PTC. Parametric Technology Corporation in the 90s. They were just, they created robots. Sensomatic. Oh, I, I, can, I can think of a decent one. IBM? PT, well, yeah, the original sort of IBM sales training, but PTC was the one. They were an army of 20 Veritas, Salesforce, yeah. Oracle, Salesforce SAP. in the early days, not so much now. Oracle, not so much. Well, not at all now. SAP, not at all now. But if you look at... Software AG? We're well, talking the more the, Amer the American ones, though, really. But a lot of companies you know, that have been very, very successful very computer software. have created armies of completely similar people and then coached them in their own image. Which is, which is exactly. Coached them in their own image to their own mould. And if you don't want to play the image and you don't want to play the process and you don't want to be the mould and you don't want to do it precisely our way, we don't care and you're off. Yeah, we'll graph. And they made millions. I can doing once it. remember somebody getting fired from CA, and I don't know how true this was. What's this late nineties, late two thousand one. He, pho I placed him. He phoned me the morning in the morning and said, "I don't work there anymore." He'd been there half a day, and I said, "Why not?" He said, "Because I turned up without town." Yeah, <laughs> turned up without town. But what you're actually talking about is you're talking about cults, not sales forces. Yes, PTT and that's an interesting point. They that they, they they did coach, but actually that. That team, that PTC team, late 90s, they created a cult. Not Jacko's was a cult when we worked there. Yeah, it was. I bet Pareto was. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, so we're up. So, so just getting through this a little bit, actually, because there's 15 of these questions, Johnny. We could talk about this for bloody hours. Yeah, to be fair, um, living everywhere but now, toxic tactic number four. I wrote here, this is beyond the auspices of this book and shouldn't be here. Right, next one then. Um, I think that, that, you know, you're into books about mindfulness and being being in the present moment I, I just think that more than anything our author should have directed our reader there into another rabbit hole um and about the whole concept of being present be process driven to be present next one coach one gap at a time i think he's 100 percent right about that definitely he he, learnt, he was talking when he was at google he was it was he was doing a management <laughs> workshop for google <laughs> he's got some network this fellow hasn't he yeah good for him yeah absolutely yeah you can't knock him um, toxic tactic number eight in search of the perfect coaching question uh, oh I think that's a fair point what that you're always sort of linguistically looking for the perfect question yeah toxic tactic, num tactic number seven missed that one for some reason coaching is for losers loser yeah uh, and his point there is double dipping on questions toxic tactic number six well his point about the loser thing is he said, surely you should coach your top guys as well. We should coach... Uh, uh, I always read in a couple of different books, actually, the person that should get you most attention is your top salesman. Because he's the one bringing your results. Well, yes, but he's the one that gets the leads as well, I suppose. Yeah, you what, what, you, surely you give your most attention to your star player. Make sure your star player keeps being your star player and, get, and, and, and buttering thy bread, lad. Toxic ta tactic 
Number nine, caring too much. Now that's an interesting one. Caring too much. You can't we, care more about yeah, the yeah, other person's job say. than they do. Yeah, fair point. You He's can't. got a point. He's bang right. Toxic tactic 10 is everyone truly coachable. So you should figure that out in your recruitment campaign. Yes. How did you end up with somebody in your team that wasn't coachable if coaching was a was one of your priorities? If being coach, yeah. Surely that was a surely that was a surely should have interviewed for that. Surely it was a competency that you brought up in the interview process and briefed your recruiters on. Toxic tactic eleven: the coach he answers the question, not you. Well, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's great here. Toxic tactic number twelve. I agreed with. You're getting suckered by these two common I don't phrases. Know. I don't know. He's right about that. And I actually, I liked I want his to response to that. People that do I really that. liked his response to that. Well, if you did know, what would you say? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, dead simple. Or using the 60 second coaching strategy that we talked about. And, and, and the second one is I've, and, and I've, I've tried, tried everything. everything. Yeah, but then I put about you this. see, that's a patience issue for me. That's a trigger for me, that. I lose my shit when someone says that to yeah. me. Yeah, well, I see I'm different to that, actually. Because I think to myself, if you've employed somebody, they work in your sales team, you have to trust that they have had a good go at it. Yes. And what you're going to do is shout at them so they waste time on it. Yes. No, I just think... I've I've tried. I've tried everything. I've tried everything. I'll tell you now, Johnny. If I say really? I've tried everything, I've tried everything. But I have though. But, but Keith would say, "But you haven't." But I have, Keith. <laughs> but you haven't. How could I not have? Because there's always something. There's always. Yes, but am I wasting my time doing it, Keith? Yeah. Why don't I go and sell to somebody else that's got a, that's slightly easier to deal with? Well, absolutely. I've tried everything, and actually, I'm just going to go and find a better deal to work. I've on. tried enough now, Keith. Well, there's tried everything, or have you tried enough? Maybe the question should be tried enough, yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, and then the, the other point around that whole thing about I don't know, I'm a big fan of, really, you don't know? I'll tell you what, then. Why don't you have a think about it tonight? And come back to me with, with what you reckon in the morning. You usually find when you send people away to go and have another think about it, they normally well, they've just been lazy, gone. aren't they? Yes. So the, the, the phrase should have lazy. been, I can't be asked to think about it. I can't be asked to think about it, and you're the chief problem solver, so why don't you come up with a solution, dipstick? Oh, this is one for you, Johnny. Toxic tactic 14, losing patience in coaching. <laughs> I actually put it here. Or thinking this is one for you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> or what about th thinking you're super coach? Yeah, we're well, going to get that a lot. There's a lot of ego, isn't there? Yeah, I think the whole a lot of the coaching thing for me I wrote here comes down to honesty, humour, humility, and relationships. Yes, particularly in enrolment. If you're really going to enrol somebody really well, if you do it with enough honesty, humour, and humility, and the quality of your relationship is there anyway, you'll be all right. But if you've got a shit relationship with somebody, and then you decide you're going to start coaching them, don't be surprised if it's all a bit stilted. I agree. Um, and then losing patience in coaching, yeah. Um, here are some typical re reactions I have here from managers. I already know the answer. I don't have time. It takes too long. Never lose your patience again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Chapter 13, Culture Shift. Sustaining the habit of coaching. I thought this was a quick, easy chapter with some good <laughs> advice. Okay, go on. Uh, I like the fact you were talking about peer-to-peer -peer coaching. But it's a bit impractical for some of the clients that we have. I think it's a bit impractical for probably about 95% of the clients we have. But we are go we are having, uh, this December, we're just having a few beers really, aren't we, I think. But actually what we are talking about is having uh, a peer-to-peer -peer meeting group where you can... Yeah, put, mastermind groups. Yeah, so you put sales directors who work for different businesses so they're not competing with each other in the same room so they can all sit there and share ideas. Yes, which is much easier peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Yes. Yeah, and actually, we could probably Because peer-to-peer coaching is easy with some of uh, Keith's clients, isn't it? Well, it could be a very nice opportunity for Keith to come to Curry Club if he's in England um, and present, because in reality, it's a room full of sales leaders who probably buy coaching. Um, yeah, yeah. And to, to help create the mastermind group, maybe. I thought monthly coaching mindshare sessions. That's like obviously that. between peers. Love that. Get your own coach. So he said the coach needs a coach. I couldn't agree more. 100% right on the money. Yeah, I've got to tell you one of the... I know a fella who's incredibly successful and I'm not just talking about, oh, he's done well, he earned half a million last year. I'm talking 50, 100 million. Um, he has a coach. Well, all the best golfers do. Yeah. Um, I, and actually, I thought with this, I thought to myself, you know what Keith should do with his models, if you're listening, Keith, is Keith should create a software platform that incorporates all his models for managing. 
Yeah. Why don't you create an over a, a, a wrapper that sits across force.com or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, so chapter- mindful moment. The final transformation, chapter fourteen. Yes. As we near the end of our journey together, ponder this: Why do you want to be a manager? It was one of the first questions I asked you when we began our voyage of transformation. Hmm. So why do you think most people want to be managers, Matt? Because society tells them they ought. Because they get... Okay, so let's go through this. So there's a few things. One... I think just society tells them they ought to. Other than the business owner, obviously. Be a good boy, Michael, or you'll never get a job in management. Yeah, it's a bit like that, isn't it? You listen in class, Michael. Get good A-levels or you'll never get a job in management. So there's partially that. The other thing is, I think that ego is the salesperson's best friend. And enemy at the same time. Worst enemy at the same time. Yes. Okay. How about the fact that I think a lot of people go into management because they haven't managed themselves that well as salespeople, aren't performing at the level that they'd ever hoped that they would, and are looking for a softer landing in life. Mm, I think that's less... I've got to be honest, I don't that's see me that being as much. Harsh? Yeah, I do actually. I see that a lot. Particularly when interviewing, I see a lot of people, oh yeah, I really feel it's time. It, it, it's a, a line of bullshit where I often meet a candidate and I think, oh, come on, mate. If you would, if, if your last five years had gone 120, 110, 120, 110, 130, 140 uh, percent to target, are you really telling me you'd be looking for a management gig right now? Oh, if they're out of work, obviously. I really feel like uh, I'm ready to pass on some knowledge to the next generation. No, uh, I don't think that drives it, actually. I don't think it is a fair thing, personally. I think it's, I think it's an ego. I think it's a... I, th- I think that we just are bombarded with propaganda about going to work at Microsoft and becoming a sales director. So we do it. I, you know, these graduate intakes where there's Accenture and Cap yes, Gemini. I think it's bullshit spun at kids. Just propaganda uh, nonsense. Uh, on That's university, my point, yeah. It's bullshit spun at kids on university milk grounds yeah. by PricewaterhouseCoopers and Accenture. Correct. That, that they will one day be in a leadership position. But actually nobody says to them, uh, actually kids, one day you could earn shit loads of money and go t- and, and, and disappear it's, off to... It's, the, it's more than you that. You can earn shit loads of money it, and disappear to the it, gym it, at one it, o'clock. It, it's more than that. What, what they don't say is, actually kids... Do you know what you want to do to be happy? Yeah. And that's the real question that they don't understand. It's a bit philosophical, really, for now, I think. But I think often what happens is, if you look at that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people see the move into management as self actualization That's it's above and beyond reaching further and further peaks in their sales career. Correct. And that's what goes wrong with it. And actually... They, that they therefore think that is their source of happiness. And also because actually people have a wealth thermostat. So it might be, for example, you know, everybody's got their wealth thermostat and that's a topic for another day. But you and I talk often about the wealth thermostat, don't we? Mm-mm. And some people's wealth thermostats are set at 80k and they're good to go. That's as good as they get. There's still and, quite a lot of money. Yes, but that's as good as they get. And they're like, well, I'm earning £80,000 a year. It's a lot of money. My wife's earning £60,000 a year in her job in the NHS. So that's £140,000 between us. That, that's a, a family that are earning a lot of money. Of course it is, and yeah. therefore they go, hold on a minute. Do I need to up my game and get a, a job where I'm earning one hundred and twenty or one hundred and sixty or two hundred k a year? Or is it now time? And like you say, they move up the Maslow's hierarchy. Just in a different way. To self-actualise a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, 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 but I mean, you know, he, he's, he's, his points are all fair, obviously. Um, now, can I tell you what I think about the book? Or do you want to tell me more about the chapter? Um, that's it. We're done. Seven steps to creating a top performance coaching culture was really good. Become the model of exemplary sales leadership. Bring this coaching habit and framework into your company. And then acknowledgements and about the author. Just like to say, Keith also values adventuring, doing hot yoga, playing guitar, trying to sing, making an impact, biking, golfing. Me and Keith going to get on great. A fellow yogi, a fellow hot yogi, a fellow musician. A yeah. fellow golfer. Man, Keith, you've got a lot in common. <laughs> At least two of you play golf and ride bikes. Um, Keith believes music, literature and the arts can create world peace. I'm there with you, Keith. We're gonna, we're Where gonna have you read this? this? This is about the author. I always, you know me, I read prefaces. I don't read and that. I, always I don't read that. So what do you think of the book then? Come on. Uh, so genuinely, I think it's, for me, been the most useful book we've done on the show thus far. Okay. And? I found some of the chapters a bit hard work. 
as a right. reader. Yeah. But uh, uh, I've, well I've, written another book, I thought. It's come at a very good time for me as we as we've started scaling our business again. So as a book, it's come. It's been really timely. Um, we're scaling. We're adding more bodies. We're about to go into the next couple of weeks of business planning for 2019, where I can't imagine that there won't be, as part of that business plan, a couple more bodies, two or three, who knows? And therefore, I'm back in that phase of leading people more than we have done. And it's got me really thinking. What it's also done is made me realise, actually, that I've personally grown a lot in the last couple of years, more than I thought I had as a leader, which has been great and very satisfying. But it's given me some great takeaways to go into the next business cycle as a leader and got me thinking more about A, avoiding some mistakes I've made in the past and B, improving on some of the things that we've been doing. So I've enjoyed it. It's been, it's been good. I'll tell you what I think of it, right? I think it is an excellent book and well worth reading. Um, you'll try your hardest to use stuff from it. If you can follow it to the letter it will work the um operative phrase in that being if you can because i think it's such a tough framework and ideology to dip in and out of and very tough to get into it into a set culture that people will struggle with it i think ca these are these are people who have corporate companies. well these are people that keith references um and some others i think that google oracle. microsoft oracle salesforce CA, SAP, I've met lots and lots and lots of people from these companies and this book bears no resemblance whatsoever as to how any of them have done their jobs as managers or how they've been managed. I think that it's absolutely, it's a brilliant idea, it's a bit like communism. It's a great idea in practice. <laughs> Don't you think? Um, it's a brilliant model. Well, no, but you, actually, you, you're working with a guy at the moment who actually, actually is a staunch and superb coach of salespeople. Who's that? You're working with him right now. Am I? Yeah. Who is from an Oracle, CA, IBM, SAP background. That's pretty much how his CV reads. I just, I just don't think, I, you know, I think the people that have, that, that have written the comments of this book, some fellow from Salesforce is obviously like a top guy. It's, I'll tell you what it is. It's a top book. It's not quite congruent with our brand in as much as you and I focus on clients between well, five that. and 120 million turnover well, and with one to one to 15 salespeople. Yes. And therefore the nature of those organizations lend themselves much less to having a coaching environment. I don't think it suits the IT industry necessarily though. Cause what are you gonna do? Pitch up with this book tomorrow at SAP and go, right, got a new idea. Yeah, but they will. But will they actually but be able to do it? Yes. And do you know what? If you took a straw poll, if I went into SAP now, you, you make out that every single leader in SAP is a Muppet. They're not. I've never said that at all. I've said that they, manage, they just don't manage people like this. I think you'll find that there's some great leaders and some great coaches who are developing people really? beautifully, yes. It'd be nice to get some comment from somebody out there. Uh, but I think you'll also find there are some shockers. Uh, you'll find that in any business. Well, our point is about this book is I just think it's a bit impractical for those people. I don't see how in practice I'll tell you what I think that where the book takes me is if we ran a business now and we had 100 employees and we had three sales teams of five yeah and we had three sales leaders and Keith said look mate it's uh, 1750 pounds per day for two days per delegate I'll do a deal on all your three sales leaders seven grand to put them through my sales leadership program I'll come to Leeds and do it and buy it I'd have to disagree. I don't think I would. I would. I'd buy it. I would. I'd, I'd, I'd buy the coaching. I'd buy the training. I would. I think that as much as you can learn from the book, at some point, actually, what you need is to sheep dip yourself in it for a couple I just of days wouldn't, I just wouldn't buy and that. learn it. I just wouldn't buy that. Would you buy Miller Hyman over that? Yeah. So you'd buy Miller Hyman over actually developing your sales leaders into better coaches? Yeah, Miller Hyman addresses a different issue. Okay, so why is, le why is coaching not important? I'm not saying it's not important. Listen, I, in an ideal world, you would follow that book. Yeah. But I just don't think you're going to get that into an organisation. What, a coaching... For no, I think the biggest problem is... That's just asking for a massive culture change. The biggest problem is, 
and he does allude to it in the book, which is... Well, he goes about creating a subculture, which is yes. a good idea. It's a good idea. Yes. I don't think it's possible to create rich coaching cultures. No, not, not in the high pressure that he sails. In the tech sector. I, I just don't think that's possible. I do think it's possible to create rich sales coaching subcultures. And I do think if we, let's just say we had 120 employees and we had 15 sales guys, um, all doing different sales jobs of different sorts. Mm, mm, mm. And, I, and, and I, I would pay for our sales leaders to develop our sales coaches. Why wouldn't you? But I don't think they'd be able to do it in the way that he wants it done. No, but nobody does anything that is ideally prescribed in any training that you send them on until they A, integrate the learning and B, truly mm. take it on board. So if you send somebody on a training course, if you put somebody on a sales leadership training course, how many people actually swallow, drink drink the entire cup full of Kool-Aid? But I think you very need to drink few. the entire book with this. I think you can only take out very top line stuff. There's a lot to take in. Mm. But listen, I'm not knocking the book. It's a lot is, it a good, is it a good book? And, and if somebody phoned me up tomorrow and said, listen, Mike, get a bit of whinge about that book. Should I buy it? I'd say, yeah, definitely. Definitely buy it. I'd say, definitely, definitely buy it. Because actually... If there's a couple of scripts, particularly around the leads process, there's some lovely scripts where if actually you you copied them and printed them, and actually Keith does allude to going onto his website and downloading some of the primers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you copied and alluded to them, if you had them in front of you when you walked into a session with a salesperson, if you walked into a session with a salesperson and you thought today I'm just going to use these questions, mm. tell you what, if you did that with every one-on-one. -on -one, and had enrolled each person, used the enrolling scripts and said, listen, if you went to every salesperson in your team and said, look, mate, I've just been on a course. Are not going to tell them you've let them down? No, I'm bloody well not. <laughs> but if I went to every salesperson in the team and said, listen, I've just been on this course and it was really good, actually, and I got a lot out of it, and I'm going to try and bring some of it into some of the stuff we do, because I think it might actually help us. So next time I meet, I'm going to ask a load of questions that I've already got written down. You all right with that? Yeah, all right, boss. Yeah, I suppose. And then you went into it and you two of you had a bit of a smile and a laugh about it with a smile on your face, but you actually made a good concerted human open effort to say, come on, give me a break. I'm really trying here to be more of a coach than a, mm. than a director here. Come on, mate. And, you, and the other sales guy went along with you. I think you would, I think if you had a team of 10 and, that w and you'd previously been a chief problem solver, I think you would transfer into being a coach. And I think that that coaching over time would reap dividends and make your team less dependent. And as somebody who has done, you know, over the time that we've run the business, a lot of coaching or leadership that has felt very codependent, I'm in. Fair enough. Listen, I'm not locking the book, Johnny. You can stick up for Keith. I'm I'd sticking up for him. I'd buy the book. I think it's good. I think <laughs> you'd it's buy good. the book and you'd recommend it. Oh, definitely. 100%. It's the best book we've read so far. Yes. And it's one of the best books I've read for ages. Uh, well, sales book. Sales book. I'm finding yeah. Slash's biographies a lot more exciting. <laughs> a bit more rock and roll. Well, I've just finished Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as well with my daughter. Right, absolutely. Right, good. So that is us at the end of another show. We've had plenty to talk about. We have. Sales Leadership by Keith Rosen. Is it goes on, the, on pile. the pile. At some point, Pricey, the pile's going to get too high, which means we may need to knock one we off just the bottom. We can just get rid of the ones that we haven't read that are there as props. Yeah, we can. But well, I think like this big I, thick I, NLP one, no one's read that. No, but I, I have actually had some coaching from Sue Knight. Right, good. Uh, uh, who, so you bought a book out of sympathy. No, I've read the book first. Um, so next week, everybody, Keith is on the show. So turn up, check it out. It will be available on video and on podcast on all major podcasting platforms. We forgot to say at the start of the show, if you like what you're watching, smash the like button. I don't button. even bother asking anymore because everybody's so fearful. They're frightened. Because there are like a lot of people watch this now. <laughs> hit the like button, hit the share button. Thanks ever so much. See you later. Bye-bye.